It is midnight in Washington, 5 in London, and 2 on a Thursday afternoon here in Seoul. I'm Moon Gan Young. Here are the top stories making headlines at this hour. The House of Delegates in the U.S. state of Virginia passes a bill that says school textbooks in that state must now use the names East, Sea, and Sea of Japan. We'll have the details. North Korea rejects South Korea's proposal to hold a Red Cross talks and holding regular reunions for families separated by the Korean War amid fresh tensions over anti-Pyongyang leaflets. Chief diplomats of the U.S. and Russia failed to reach a deal on Ukraine on a day of frantic diplomacy, even as pressure grows on the EU to pass punitive measures against Moscow. Now we'll have those stories and more, but first let us begin in Geneva. Korea's Foreign Minister Yoon Byung-se has demanded Tokyo admit to its sexual enslavement of Korean women during the Second World War. Now he was speaking at a U.N. session in Geneva Wednesday where he also slammed Japanese officials for attempting to whitewash that country's past wrongdoings. Here's Arirang News' Hwang Sung-hee with this story. Speaking before the UN Human Rights Council in Geneva on Wednesday, South Korean Foreign Minister Yoon Byung-se urged Japan to take responsibility and compensate the victims of its wartime sexual slavery. Calling for an end in sexual violence in armed conflicts, he noted violations that took place in the past in which the perpetrators have yet to repent, pointing to the so-called comfort women as a living evidence. This is an added insult to the honor and dignity of those victims who had weathered physical and psychological pains in their lifelong haunted memories. Such an attitude is an affront to humanity and disregards the historical truth. An estimated 200,000 women, mostly Korean, were used as sex slaves by the Japanese army in the early 20th century. This marks the first time since 2006 that a top diplomat from Korea is attending the UN Human Rights Council session, and the first time ever the comfort women issue was raised, a sign that Seoul is serious about tackling the matter. Referring to comments recently made by Japanese vice education minister, who claimed the Japanese military's use of sex slaves is a fabricated story, Minister Yun stressed the importance of educating correct history. The starting point of the prevention of human rights violations is for countries to admit past wrongdoings, take responsibility for such deeds, and educate the correct history to the future generations. Minister Yoon also touched upon a recent UN report on North Korea's human rights violations and expressed hopes it will lead to practical steps for improving human rights conditions in the regime. Top diplomats from around 50 nations attended the UN Human Rights Council session, but Japanese Foreign Minister Fumio Kishida was not present. Hwang Sang-hee, Arirang News. Now, over in the U.S., another huge step was made in the push for the dual use of the Korean name East Sea and the Japanese name Sea of Japan in school textbooks in the state of Virginia. Our Park ji tells us more. The so-called East Sea Bill has passed the Virginia House of Delegates, the last phase of the legislative process, in an 82 to 16 vote. The bill requires all textbooks approved by the Board of Education to note that the Sea of Japan is also referred to as the Korean name East Sea. As the bill passed the state Senate in January, it now only requires the governor's signature for it to become law. Governor Terry McAuliffe is expected to sign the bill by early April at the latest, and the bill will take effect from July 1st. The passing of the bill is a major victory for the state's estimated 82,000 Korean-American residents. They had to overcome intense lobbying by the Japanese government in which Tokyo warned it might reconsider Japanese investment in the state. The Korean-American community in Virginia has been pushing hard for the change since the early 1990s. They, as well as all Koreans, view the Sea of Japan designation as an unpleasant reminder of Japan's brutal colonization of the Korean Peninsula in the early to mid-20th century. 
The Korean American community aims to further introduce the dual naming bill in U.S. states with high Korean American populations like California, New York, and New Jersey. They ultimately hope to change the U.S. government's single name policy regarding sea names. The International Hydrographic Organization, or IHO, published a book designating official names of the seas in 1929. Japan registered the name Sea of Japan to refer to the body of water that separates Korea and Japan. However, as Korea was colonized by Japan back then, it had no way to voice its opposition on the world stage. The Korean government has been calling for the IHO to change the current single name of the sea to at least the dual naming as the term EC has been used in Korea for thousands of years. Park Ji-won, Arirang News. North Korea has turned down South Korea's proposal for Red Cross working level talks. The North said through the inter-Korean hotline on Thursday that a good atmosphere for discussing reunions for war-separated families has not been created. Now, it also noted the issue of holding the reunions on a regular basis should not be discussed between Red Cross officials. Experts had earlier speculated that the North would want to hold talks at a higher level. Well, Seoul's Unification Ministry said it's currently reviewing what steps to take next. North Korea's response comes a day after the South offered to meet for Red Cross talks next Wednesday. President Park Geun-hye has vowed to ensure there are no welfare blind spots in the Korean society. Now, she also pledged to open an era of trust and peace on the Korean Peninsula. Speaking at the annual National Prayer Breakfast Thursday, President Park said, Korea is at the point of having to lay the groundwork to take the next leap through the economic and social innovation and achieve happiness and a peaceful reunification on the peninsula. Now, in order to get there, she said, straightening out irregularities in society, including corruption and graft, would be a pressing matter. The Korean leader then said she will make sure every citizen has the means to fully achieve their potential and enjoy the fruits of economic growth. High-level diplomatic efforts to resolve the crisis in Ukraine failed to make much headway at talks in Paris on Wednesday. Now, Washington and Moscow were unable to see eye to eye while Russia refused to recognize the interim Ukrainian government. As our Connie Kim reports, the top diplomats of the two countries will continue their talks on this Thursday. International efforts to resolve the crisis in Ukraine took baby steps forward in Paris Wednesday, with the United States and Russia agreeing to continue talks the next day, but no progress was made between Russia and the new Ukrainian government. Speaking after the meeting, U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry said talks with Russia will continue to try and de-escalate the crisis. Uh, we agreed to continue intense discussions in the coming days with Russia with the Ukrainians in order to see how we can help normalize the situation, stabilize it, and overcome the crisis. Kerry said there were no expectations that the talks would resolve the conflict, but added there are a number of ideas on the table. U.S. officials say Kerry had presented Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov with a plan for restoring Ukraine's sovereignty while addressing Moscow's concerns about its Black Sea Fleet and the many ethnic Russians that live in eastern Ukraine. The two are expected to meet again in Rome on Thursday. Lavrov confirmed that the talks would continue, but discussions between Russia and Ukraine did not materialize, with the Russian Foreign Minister calling Ukraine's new government illegitimate. In Brussels, NATO announced there will be no talks with Moscow after Russian President Vladimir Putin refused to pull out Russian forces from Ukraine's Crimea Peninsula, where the tense standoff continues between pro-Russian forces and the Ukrainian military. NATO said it will also back out from a joint mission linked to Syrian chemical weapons and help build the capacity of the Ukrainian military. Meanwhile, the European Union has unveiled a package of aid and grants to Ukraine's new government worth some 15 billion U.S. dollars over the next couple of years. Connie Kim, Arirang News. All of the day's important events, events close to home and around the world. Join Moon Gon Yong, live from Seoul.
Korean government has unveiled a set of measures to ease regulations that hamper corporate merger and acquisition activities. Now, this move aimed at fostering venture startups into global companies comes as part of the government's three-year economic innovation plan. Arirang News' Hwang Ji-hye has this report. Boosting mergers and acquisitions is standing out as one of the key agenda items in the three-year economic innovation plan laid out by the Park Geun-hye administration. The administration aims to create a virtuous circle where venture startups can grow into global companies through the active participation of private equity funds and strategic investors in the mergers and acquisitions market. Finance Minister Hyun woo said Thursday that the government will streamline tax and financial support systems to remove regulations that hinder corporate M&A activities. The government will expand the size of a growth fund for the merger and acquisition activities of venture firms and small and medium-sized companies to around $930 million within the next three years. Hyun said citing a local report that the nation's M&A market could nearly double in 2017 from last year to $65 billion with the set of measures the government has laid out. To reach these goals, he emphasized the importance of M&A market participants like companies and investors making good use of the measures. The finance ministry said the local M&A market has continued to shrink after the global financial crisis in 2007 and 2008, while the size is smaller than those in other advanced economies. It added that a sluggish M&A market prevents the kind of voluntary business restructuring that allows companies to focus their investments on core areas. Hwang Jie, Arirang News. The Financial Supervisory Service has dismissed a case related to a recent data leak that affected millions here in Korea. The Financial Watchdog said Thursday that its deliberation committee had rejected a claim filed by Financial Consumer Agency Chief Cho Nam-hee on behalf of 200 consumers demanding compensation for damages incurred as a result of the massive data leak. Now, the FSS said the committee dismissed the claim because Cho and the 200 people who are part of the claim had failed to provide any new evidence about the incident, which compromised the personal information held by several financial institutions in January. Cho now says he'll file a formal objection to the FSS decision after revising the claim. The chief of SK Group will step down from his post as chairman after being found guilty of embezzling company funds. Now, this will remove the 53-year-old Che Tae Wan from management, but he will remain a major shareholder in the group, which is the country's third largest conglomerate. Che was sentenced to a four-year prison term last week for embezzling 47 million U.S. dollars from company affiliates and using that money for personal investments. Che is not the only conglomerate boss to step down after a corruption conviction. The chairman of Hanwha Group Kim Sin yeon stepped down from executive positions at company affiliates last month after the courts found him guilty of corruption. The chairman of CJ Group is also expected to step down later this month for the same reasons. LG Electronics is quickly catching up to its smartphone rivals Samsung Electronics and Apple. Well, the company rose to third in global smartphone sales last year, beating out companies like HTC and Sony and jumping up from sixth in 2012. Now, market researcher Strategy Analytics said Thursday that LG Electronics brought in about 11.1 billion US dollars last year, which is about 4% of the industry's combined revenues. The rise in sales was attributed to the popularity of its high-end models such as the Optimus G, G Pro and G2 smartphones. Now, a new school year has begun for many Korean students this week. More than 70 percent of high school graduates in Korea enter college, but not all of them attend what you'd call traditional universities. A growing number are going online to do their studies. Our Kwan reports. 
The excitement is in the air at Seoul National University's orientation ceremony, where thousands of new students are marking the start of a four-year journey. It's the same scene at another welcoming event for freshmen at another university. But here at Seoul Cyber University, students do not walk around the campus looking for their classrooms, they jump on the internet to take their classes. Moon so Yun is a Cyber University sophomore. She graduated from a two-year college program but became interested in counseling psychology and tried to find a way to balance a job and her studies. The biggest advantage of taking Cyber University classes is that you have no restrictions as to time, location or age. So Yun says sudden pop quizzes and discussions make the courses more interactive. Many cyber universities do not limit their education to online classes, but give students the opportunity to take part in offline courses and activities at their offline campuses. Professors say online classes are not only good for students, but for teachers as well. For professors of offline universities, it's not easy to receive feedback or monitor yourself. And that goes for me too, as I've worked at conventional universities for 10 years. But since my classes are now filmed, I can get concrete feedbacks. There were only nine cyber universities in Korea in 2001. Today, there are 21. The number of cyber students is on the rise too, jumping from 6,000 in 2001 to nearly 115,000 in 2013. Experts attribute the jump to the increasing number of students pursuing lifelong education. Much lower tuition prices have also played a role. However, cyber universities still face challenges compared to brick-and-mortar institutions. I think it's uh, credibility of a cyber university degree is uh, right now is ongoing examination period of time. Some areas is uh, the quality is doubt is uh, in terms of the uh, uh, degree programs and the methodology of uh, teaching and the learning and uh, their uh, job skills etc. Despite the self-evident figures and the increasing popularity of cyber universities, it will take time for them to develop the respect afforded to conventional schools. Kwon Soa, Arirang News. Let's now take a look at some sports news. South Korea pulled off somewhat of a surprise Wednesday night, defeating Greece 2-0 in their own backyard. In their last friendly match before the World Cup finals begin in Brazil in June, Korea put the Greeks to the sword through two goals by Park Ju Young and Son Heung Min. Greece, who sit a lofty 12th in the FIFA rankings, had several chances to score, hitting the goal post once and the crossbar twice. With the latest victory, Korea, 61st in the FIFA rankings, stands at five wins, six losses, and three draws since head coach Hong Myung Bo took over last June. It is now time for our daily arts and culture segment, and for the latest update, we are joined live in the studio by our Im Yoon Hee. Good afternoon to you, Yoon Hee. Good afternoon. Now, I hear you have some uh, traditional pieces for us today. Yes, I do. So, uh, yesterday we looked at a hand ballet, more of a contemporary work. Today, I have a legend in Korean traditional dance. He has been in the business for over 50 years, very passionate about the future of Korean traditional dance. Let's see what Kuk Suk Mo has been up to these days. Designated as an important intangible cultural asset since 1969, Sungmu is one of the oldest and most recognizable traditional Korean dances. Kuk Su Ho has been a Sungmu dancer for 50 years now. Starting at the young age of 16, he's been performing on stages around the country, showing his years of experience gained by traveling the world. As I traveled around the world, going to over 130 different countries, I thought about how I could dance this Korean dance. I spent the last 50 years gaining experience so that I can create themes and ideas for this dance. Even when it was hard to make any living, Kuk Su Ho decided to become the first male dancer to use dance and his choreography as his sole source of income. To preserve the future of Korean dance, He's combined the traditional culture of Korean dance with a newly designed stage. 
It's unbelievable that Korea doesn't have a stage made only for this traditional Korean dance. I've waited 10 out of the past 50 years for this moment and have been preparing this stage for a very long time. In order for future generations to inherit and keep this tradition of Korea's cultural heritage, it must be preserved and developed by dancers such as Kuk Soo-ho. He's developed his entire life to this art, and all he requests is that Korea show her love and support for traditional Korean dance. In Korea, music, sounds and dance are not just a preference. For the Korean people, it's an indispensable necessity of life, consumed to feed the spirit. Wow, um, Kuk Suo is such a legendary figure here in um, Korea for his traditional dancing. And he does all different types of dance, but here in your report, Yoon Hee, it seems like he was uh, practicing uh, the Seungmu. Yes, exactly. So, uh, Seungmu is actually mentioned in the report, one of the intangible cultural assets. But there's actually a neat story behind Seungmu. So, first of all, it's very distinct by the outfit worn. It's that Buddhist monk wardrobe with the long sleeves and the, and the cap. Uh, but Seungwu has a neat story behind it. There's a legend saying that it originated in the Chosun dynasty uh, when one of the very well-known courtesans or Jisangs of that era, uh, she used Seungwu for the first time to seduce one of the Buddhist monks. And so there's a story behind that legend that whether it's true or not, nobody knows. Uh, but creates an interesting tale. Definitely. I mean, there are many fun legends behind, you know, all these traditions. And I guess we'll never know the truth, but, you know, the myths are the myths, and that's the exciting part. Now, Yunhia, you were telling me earlier on that you have another kind of uh, art or type of art that you'd like to introduce us to. Exactly. So the galleries here in Seoul, there are a ton. They're always changing out. Um, I have some of the works that are recently being shown in the galleries here in Seoul. Let's take a look. The pine tree, a beautiful piece of nature, seen repeatedly in Korean art. This artist focused his work on replicating the pine tree, and for the past 10 years, this tree is all that he's been drawing. The pine tree is special because there are many scenarios where it strengthens the heart. I thought that Koreans were very similar to pine trees in this sense. The history of Korean people resembles the tree. After winning the inaugural award for the Misus Hege art magazine, his works, along with his paintings of the human body, have been put on display at the Misus Hege gallery. His famous pine tree paintings, along with his newer works, contribute to the art culture of Insadong. Another different type of art can be found nearby. The three-dimensional interactive works of Ku Hyun Mo can be found at the PKM gallery. His recent gallery, called Sajikdong, is a recollection and recreation of memories from his younger days growing up in the Sajikdong neighborhood. The miniature house-like renditions with their simple manners show Ku's style of freely traversing through time and space, a motif he carries throughout his works. If you get anxious, it's not a bad thing. Outside, it can be fun to take that and shape it to be free-floating and good. And on the opposite side of Ku's nature-inspired work is European pop artist Julian Opie. His works are interactive and playful. They juxtapose still paintings against animated works, making it fun for spectators to enjoy. Yunhee, that's a wide range of uh, different types of arts being exhibited in Insadong area, and you were telling me how there are many, many art galleries there. Mm -hmm. So, if I'm sure you've noticed, Insadong is has a theme. It's a bit of a more traditional cultural theme, um, but there are many galleries in Insadong. Recently, uh, there. These gallery tours have been very popular. So here in Seoul, you can take a tour that's specifically for art galleries, and you can visit the very many, many galleries, big and small, that are located in Insadong, which contains some of the most renowned galleries here in Seoul. So great location for these galleries we covered today. Definitely. And uh, you know, with the weekend coming up, it's definitely a good way to spend time with your f family and friends if you are plan to stay in the city. Mm -hmm. All right, Yuni, thank you so much for that. And uh, we'll speak to you next week. My pleasure. Thank you.
Good afternoon. Today is Gyeongchip in Korea, which signifies the beginning of spring when the insects starts to appear. But I don't think they're going to come out in this kind of cold. Now, also, we are advised that there is a dry weather warning in effect in some regions. Now, for more details, let's move over to our satellite map. The country looks pretty clear today. However, there will be times where there will be snow in some places in the central region. Now, going over to our readings, Seoul will top out at 6 in the afternoon. Meanwhile, the southern, southern cities such as Gwangju and Busan will peak up to 8 and 9 degrees, respectively. Now, down onto Jeju Island, it's very windy at 8. Tukdu will get up to 1, while Mount Kumgang tops down to minus 1. Well, that's all for now. I'm Michelle Park, and back to you, Kanyang. Well, thank you, Michelle, for that. And that's all from me at this hour. Thank you for watching. I'll see you back here with Business Today at 4 p.m. Korea time.